it's so awesome. And, you know, I, there's so many people that are just terrified of it. And I'll be honest with you, I don't do the pictures, but I don't mind oh. doing the video because I can, you know, I can plug into the voice. So, but the pictures, I have no voice. So. Okay. <laughs> I see. Okay, so I guess we can start. You can guys uh, write us uh, the questions. We will look at them at the end, so we're not distracted because we will be recording this. Uh, I mean, at least Blob promised me that they will send me the recordings <laughs> of audio and video, and I hope it all works well. I, it says recording now, so it should work. So uh, not to confuse the podcast, which will be recorded and put as a right to be read podcast episode, we will go ahead with the episode. But at the end, we will definitely read your questions and address those in the last 15 minutes. We will be answering your questions. OK. OK, so uh, today my guest is Tracy, Tracy Goodwin, and she is, uh, why I invited her to my podcast is because I think her expertise is really great for uh, our listeners uh, because she is an expert of voice technique and storytelling, and it's something that we all need to know, and uh, I'm sure that it will help us a lot in our, um, you know, presenting ourselves and, of course, presenting our stories, personal stories as well as our creative writing stories. So welcome to the podcast. I'm really happy to have you over. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and I'm actually double excited that you suggested we do a blab because I've been hearing about it and I started checking it out last night so when you asked if we could do it this way I thought yay how cool is that so uh, uh, well, thank you and I hope I'll have some golden nuggets for your listeners okay I, I will have to ask you to put back the earphones because uh, my echo is being uh, you know okay. heard on your end. <laughs> Okay. Just for the sake of the sound the quality recording. for the podcast. Uh, I can't hear you now, though. Let's see. You can't? Oh, I can hear you in here. Okay. Okay, right. good. Yeah. Good. Okay, so let's just start from the very beginning. How did you end up doing what you're doing? Because I don't um, seem to know many voice uh, technique experts and storytelling experts out there. So how did you end up there? Well, it's it's... I'll try to give you the abridged version. Um, I believe very much that everybody has a purpose. And it, it, I, it's been my purpose since I was 12 years old. When I was 12, I started winning speaking awards. And as I went on in life, I worked as a professional actor. But when I was about 17, I had an event take place in my life and it dramatically changed my voice negatively. And because I wanted to be a professional actor, I had to go in intensive voice training and I changed my voice major. Like I used to sound like, like I started sounding like this when I was 17 <laughs> because of this event that happened in my life, which I'm happy to tell the story about that. But anyway, I went on to be a professional actor and people kept seeking me out to help them with their voice, to help them with their presentations over my whole life. And I kind of kept running from it because exactly what you said, who, what kind of career, who is a voice expert? What kind of career, I mean, what is that? And then over the years, I just, I kept getting these opportunities to lead voice workshops and work with actors. And I, I cultivated the craft and I had the opportunity to work with voice masters and taught classes and taught on the university level and people kept seeking me out and finally you know I'm a little slow on the take but one day I woke up and said okay I get it this is my purpose my entire existence has been about the voice and about the story and so about 15 years ago I started solely helping people improve their voices improve their stories step into their message and share it with the world because I believe that everybody has a message. Definitely, I truly believe that everyone has a story to tell, mm -hmm. and that it's it's very, 
important and uh, yeah, to, to give it out to the world. And it's very sad when you're keeping it inside. And it's sad for both, for the person and for all the people who had to hear that message and for whom it would be important. So I truly believe in, in spreading the message and the story. So let's just think about this. Uh, we're talking about the real voice. Do you think it, this, uh, you know, the real voice um, insecurities may transform into your writing voice as well? Does it affect, like, you know, uh, also the writing style? Absolutely, absolutely. And what I've discovered over the years, and it started with my training back when I was 17 years old, is that our voice, whether it is written or spoken, is absolutely directly linked to our psychology. So whatever we're thinking, whatever our environmental factors are, whatever our experiences are, directly affect us. And what happens over the years as we get older, we get more guarded and more guarded and more guarded. And in the spoken voice, it becomes, we start mumbling, we don't let our voice out, or we don't even speak at all. The same thing happens in writing. We become, well, what are people going to think? Well, what if people don't, what, you know, what if people think I'm dumb? What if people think I, I'm not good enough? What, you know, and all of that affects the written and spoken words to the point that people will no longer share their message. And I love what you said. There's someone out there that needs to hear every one of our direct messages, you know, I mean, just just absolutely. Somebody needs to hear your message. Somebody needs to hear my message. And they might, you know, they might be different. I mean, the person that needs to hear your message might not need to hear my message. That's why it's so important that everybody tells their message. Okay, yeah, I, I see what you mean. So what do you think? What is that? I mean, there are many people, just like in real life, who, who are really afraid to sort of, you know, speak up. There are also many people who are afraid to share their stories when they are writing, but they're keeping their writings to themselves. They're not really sharing it with others. They don't let others read their stories. So what do you think? Where does this fear come from and how to overcome that? Well, I think, you know, um, can you hear that music in the background? Yeah. Um, Jack. I'm on live. Would you mind turning the sound down? It's my son. <laughs> Sorry about okay. that. Um, I think it boils down to fear and fear of judgment. Mm -hmm. I think that we, as we get older, we have what, what I call the dings in life. And, and dings are things like criticism, things like where people told us to stop talking, things like where people, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. And, and we internalize that in our minds, but it manifests in our writing and our words. And a lot of it's on the subconscious level. We don't even realize that we're doing it. So I think, you know, I have a saying that I use in my practice and I use it with a lot of people. Run to the roar is what it's called. And the only way, so you say, how can you overcome that? The only way to overcome it is to run to the roar because far too often those voices in our head, they're this huge lion. They're this huge, I'm going to be horrible. People are not going to like me. People are going to think I'm dumb. But if we will literally walk through it, when we get there, we see it's just a little kitten. Mm -hmm. but unless we do it, unless we take the action, we just are stuck with the voices in our head that tell us it's going to be a disaster. So I think that we have to run to the roar, but I also think that we have to do it in baby steps because it's those baby steps that will build our confidence along the way. And I think it's without that confidence, it's hard to just say, okay, I'm afraid today, but I'm gonna do it tomorrow. I think we have to kind of build our confidence in small, I mean, that's just my personal experience. We kind of build our confidence in small phases. And then when we get there, we realize what we were so afraid of was was all in our head. Yeah, true. Yeah, I see. Okay, so uh, why do you think, I mean, these days, I mean, before the storytelling was very important, for creative writers, for those who were writing novels and creative books and stuff like that. And later on, uh, 
uh, storytelling came into everything. I mean, it, it, it even entered marketing recently and advertising and podcasting. Like the most popular podcasts are the ones which are storytelling based podcasts and stuff like that. So why do you think it's so important, especially these days? What's the thing that brought it up to, uh, you know, to make it so popular? Well, you know what I think is there's so much noise out there. There is so much noise. And I think in the beginning, and this is just kind of my theory, I think in the beginning all of this was really cool and, and there wasn't as much noise. And then everybody kind of got on board and started doing all of this social media and, and you know, doing all of this internet stuff and there became too much noise. And so we couldn't, we could no longer make connections. And so I think we've come full circle. We used to connect through spoken word. We used to connect via the phone. We used to connect in person. And then we got in front of the screen, which created a disconnect and all of this noise. And I think we've come all the way back around to where we want to connect again. How do we connect? We connect through stories. We connect through experiences. Oh, that happened to you? Oh my gosh, that happened to me. You understand me. We, we've connected. We want, we're seeking that. I think we've, we've morphed around back to a culture of seeking connection, seeking understanding, and there, there's nothing better than a story. Something that happened to you that happened to me, boom. We, we automatically, we're connected. We understand each other. So that's, yeah, kind, of, that's kind of my theory on it. Uh, yeah, I see. Well, actually, since, since you mentioned that happened to me, I was just wondering uh, how important and how much are you do you have to actually put your personal stories into what you're saying? How much place does your personal story have to have in the whole storytelling process? Well, again, this is this is what I believe, and this is my theory. I think it becomes important to select the right stories for the right audience. Mm -hmm. um, I think we all, I mean, the older we get, the longer we've been alive, the more stories we have. And we, you know, I could sit here all day and tell you stories. You could sit here all day and tell me stories, but what are the stories that your audience, your audience or my audience are going to connect to? Um, so I think picking the right stories is becomes very, very important. I think that the next part is the most challenging part. And I think that it's telling all the pieces of the story. Do I want to tell you the most vulnerable pieces? You know, do I want to tell you the bad stuff that happened? Because if I tell you that bad stuff, you might not, I don't know how you're going to feel about me. You might think badly of me. And I think it is through the ugly that we connect the most. I think those are the most important pieces of the story. And you know, they've done studies um, on Facebook and other social media where people will post all the, the glitter stories, but they mm. won't post the, I was laying in the street story. And it's the laying gotcha. in the street story that makes me go, oh my God, I felt that way. I felt that way two years ago. I understand, I want, I want to talk to this person. I want to work with this person because I understand them. So I think those are two really important pieces. You got to pick the right stories and you got to tell the whole story, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Oh yeah. You, you kind of, you know, you have to be ready to get uh, at least partly naked in front of your reader to make sure that it works. That's true. And I guess like, you know, many of the writers who are really ready to kind of, you know, to, to rip it all off and to bear their soul are the ones which, get the best uh, results and resonate with their readers. Oh, absolutely. I see it all the time. And it's that vulnerability. It's that vulnerability that we so try to avoid in the spoken word and in the written word. Um, you know, I read a, a post on Facebook the other day, a man had written an art. He's a very successful writer. He does a lot of big, big articles and posts. And he had uh, written a, a post that was uh, an article that was very vulnerable about his sex life and i just i just i commend him so much for that because so many people would have not gone there you know it was a bad experience and he wanted to share it and 
you know, I mean, it's just catapulted his success because he gets raw, he gets naked, like you say. And I think that's that's what we have to be willing to do, written and spoken. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now where, now where the, you know, now where the voice part comes in, mm-hmm. I believe, is that we have to do it beautifully, meaning I can say anything I want to say. I need to speak my truth, but I need to do it kindly and beautifully. You know, I can't just go barking my truth, vomiting my truth on everybody because it's mine. Well, yes, it's mine okay. and it's important, but I have to temper how I share it. And if I do, then I can make a difference. Okay, I see. Which actually reminds me of something. Many writers are introverts. And I know many writers who tell their stories beautifully and who are very easy to communicate, let's say on Facebook or on other means one-on-one, but who actually have refused to give me interviews because they are very, very kind of closed up people and very insecure and don't feel like actually using their physical voice and speaking up and and, uh, getting in front of a big audience. Mm -hmm. So uh, why do you think that is? And, you know, if if a person is in that situation, but at some certain point he has to get to conferences, to, I don't know, different book signings, he has to actually at some point meet his readers. How does he have to overcome this and actually become comfortable with you know, speaking up? That's a really, really great question. And, you know, about a year or so ago, I really started studying introverts because I always thought of myself as an extrovert. And what I discovered was that I really am an introvert. Um. Um, and and I never would have thought that because I'm, I'm, I have no problem speaking or anything like that. But there's shades of introverts. So the kind of introvert that you're talking about, you know, for me, my approach with that kind of thing would very much be about they need the confidence and they almost need, I'm going to say this and I don't know that it, I hope that it makes sense, but it, they almost need an exterior personality, almost like a character to step into. Not that they should be a character and that they shouldn't be real, but that they need a skill set that protects them. A safety net of confidence that comes through a skill set of, well, I don't I don't really want to get my voice out. This is how I get my voice out. And I know I can do it because I've successfully done it. Again, baby steps, you know, building that confidence through a technique while still being real, but that technique protects them and gives them a security that they're going to be okay. Does that make sense? Did that make yeah. sense? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. So, so it's basically, you know, I guess that, you know, at some point they do have to make something out of it. They, you know, just saying there won't help a lot. And it's, it's a little bit of courage and it's a little bit of action that they have to take in order to push forward and actually overcome that. Again, it's that run to the roar. And, you know, so many people have come to me, people, women, men, 30s, 40s, 50s, and they've gotten to a point in their career where they have to speak and they are traumatized. They're trauma. They want to quit their jobs because they don't want to do this. And all they really need is the confidence. The confidence comes in the skill. Do it like this. Oh, look, you did it. You see, you can do it. Oh, I can do it. Yeah. And you build from that. And then they leave and they're, you know, speakers. So right. I've just seen, you know, I've just seen that work. So that's certainly, that's certainly my philosophy on it. Okay, I see. Well, it's, uh, let's talk about something that is very close to me, actually. And which was the reason I launched my podcast way later than I really wanted it to launch. So let's talk about accents. Mm. I mean, I I obviously have quite heavy accent and um, I speak five languages out of which only two languages are without accents and all the rest have different accents, which are a mixture of all those five languages I speak, I guess, because none none of the accent is really kind of 
identifiable so people can't really say yeah you know she she has an armenian accent or russian accent or whatever it is so it's a mixture of everything and uh i mean in our country for example accents are have never been perceived well in a, in a sense that uh you know when when someone spoke a foreign language with a heavy accent we thought that he didn't know the language well enough, although it doesn't have anything to do with, with the knowledge of the language, but still that was our perception. So we had this negative view of accents. And uh, later on when I launched my podcast, I realized that you know many actually love the accent and it has at some point become kind of a differentiator factor actually. So I, I just want to know what is the impact of accents uh, in the communication uh, and in, in how people perceive you when you have an accent when you speak? Mm -hmm. Wonderful question again. Where are you from originally? I am from Armenia. Okay. And what languages do you speak? I speak Armenian, Russian, Bulgarian, French, and English. Wow. That's amazing. That is amazing. I have a client that I work with, accent reduction with, and she's German, but she it's the same kind of thing. So, you know, she's over here, and she speaks English, but she also lived in France, and she speaks French. And, and it's really what that does is it actually does level that out. Um, I have a client right now who is from Russia, and, and it's much harder in ways to neutralize her than it is the German woman. And they're equally very similar, you know, in what I do to neutralize them, but because the other woman has the French and the English and all of that, it all balances out. This is my take on accents, and I would say a 40% almost of my client base is neutralization of accents. And it's interesting that you said that about the accent because I had a session with a man from India just this morning and he said over there, if you have a thick accent, you're considered lower class than, than upper class, which I did not know that. And I've worked with many Indians. I think where the problem comes is twofold. Research tells us that now every 90 seconds, our brain tells us to check out. So that means we have to captivate our listeners all the time. I believe, and what my baseline is, is that if our listeners have to start working to listen to us, when that 90 seconds kicks in, we're gonna lose them. And when we lose them, it's like climbing up a mountain with a rock tied to our neck to get them back. I think people, are fascinated with accents. I think people love accents. Americans especially love people with that. Give an American a man with an accent, they can do anything they want, you know. I mean, we're just, <laughs> just fascinated with it. People come to me all the time, can you teach me accents? You know, I teach actors accents. So it's really, wow. uh, it's really a, a fascinating, fascinating subject. I don't believe you can take an accent completely away because it's in the muscle memory. It's a part of you. I can go back to my old voice anytime. It's in my muscle memory. I think where the problem arises is if it becomes hard for me to understand what you're saying. Mm. If there is, if I have to work hard, like I don't have to work hard to listen to you. I've, not, I've understood every single word you've spoken to me. There are other people, I don't understand anything they're saying. And that's a problem. So I think when it becomes a barrier to communication, it needs to be neutralized, which could be a vowel consonant issue. It could be a word weight issue. It could be a cadence issue. It could be all of the above issue. But we have become a people that is that we're so busy, we're so inundated, we are not going to, we're not gonna, just not gonna work that hard to, to try to understand if we don't have to. You know, if we jump on a podcast or a, a, a webinar and we don't understand what the person's saying, will we stay on? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. There's an audible delay in the ear that takes a little bit of time for us to understand the timbre of your voice. If in that first, you know, two minutes, I already can't understand you, am I going to stay with you or am I going to check out? Unfortunately, the chances are good we're gonna check out. So I think someone like you who's articulate, your, your vowels, your consonants, your word weight, everything is balanced and I can understand you. I could listen to you all day long. 
if I was really sitting here going, oh my gosh, what is she saying? I don't know how to answer this because I don't know, then I think it's a problem. And the way to judge that is how often do you have to repeat yourself? A lot of clients come to me and they come to me because they're sick and tired of repeating themselves constantly. So there's, uh, a, you yeah, know, same. there's a problem. If you don't have to do that, there's not a problem. I think it's, uh, you know, I think, I think all voices are beautiful. You know, I think voices just like messages, they're all different and they're all beautiful. You know. Okay. I see. Well, since you mentioned beautiful, I kind of recalled what you had told before. Uh, let's go back to telling the story beautifully. When you say that, what do you mean exactly? Because we, we can have one story and the same story can be told by different people and have completely different effect on those who listen or read the stories or, you know, hear it. So uh, what does make the difference between good storytelling and not very attractive one? From a voice perspective? From a voice perspective and also content, if, if you can. Okay. From a voice perspective, I believe it becomes about recreation of unpredictable. Like right now in our conversation, we're not scripted. I had no idea what we were going to talk about. It's, you know, it's in the moment. You're asking me questions. I'm answering. And there's this natural timber to our voices. There's certain stresses. There's highs. There's lows. There's fast. There's so It's unpredictable. It's beautiful to listen to. I think sometimes what happens when we start telling stories with our voices, we get too bogged down in the words. And, and because we'll have a script or we'll have a note and we're terrified, we're going to mess up the words. So as soon as we start getting bogged down into the words and sorry, I'm in New York City, there's a siren. We get into the words and we start delivering the words and we become predictable. And the minute we become predictable, we lose our audience. We're not interesting. We're not, we're not unpredictable. We don't, you know, if, as long as I don't know where you're going, I'm with you. And, and, and all those vocal highs and lows and fast and slows, that's what makes it beautiful. The voice, I believe, is an orchestra. How many instruments do you play? And so when we get too bogged down in the words, we start flatlining and we only have one or two instruments in our orchestra. But when we're unpredictable and we're using all the, the instruments, that's beautiful. That's music. And that's a, a beautiful story being brought to life. Now, that's a technique concept that what I'm really talking about is passion. Talking, connecting to the passion. You know, how do you really feel about this and not being afraid to share that with me? And that can segue right into the writing. Are you guarding your words? Are you telling me how you really feel? But then tell me how you really feel, but choose the right words to tell me how you really feel. Don't, mm -hmm. don't vomit anger on me. If you're angry, that's okay. You, you share that with me, but you share with me, don't attack me. It's not beautiful when you attack me with your anger or attack me with your frustration or attack me with your sadness. Share it with me, include me. And that's a different set of words. That's a different, the same emotion. I want to connect with the emotion. The emotion's what I'm gonna connect with, either in words or in voice. I wanna connect with that, but don't hammer me. Include me. Exactly. Does that make I sense? See. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, which made me actually wonder, um, you know, when you're telling your story and you're using your voice and you're using, a, you know, specifically selected words and, and different kind of, you know, heights and lows in your uh, pronunciation and stuff like that. What about uh, personality? How, how much does it relate to how you speak, how you move? And, you know, all together in complex, they have this effect because there are some people who are kind of very charismatic about how they speak and how they tell their stories. And you really want to spend more time with them. There are some people who, you know, they are not noticed so much. So it doesn't matter whether they are there or not. It doesn't make any difference. And then there are many loud people who may be really annoying. So you want just to get rid of them. 
So actually, you know, how, how one should balance his personality towards the environment he gets into, because I guess different environments uh, require different type of behavior. The same pe person can't behave the same way everywhere. Right. So, you know, how one gets this balance and are there any ways to adjust this personality? Yeah, well, um, adjusting personality, that's funny. I love that. And I love that you said that about the loud people because, you know, it's true. It's like you just, uh, like, oh, my God, get me <laughs> out of here. Get me out of here now. And then, the, and then you know, the poor people that are, uh, you know, they're, they're quiet and they, you know, I've had many clients, they say they just can't even get a sentence out because they're quieter, they're so people just roll right over them, you know. Mm -hmm. So what I like to operate in is what I call a core five. If we had a scale of one to 10, and 10 is like an auctioneer, you know, everybody, you know, like those loud people, and one is, you know, you're practically asleep. I believe that everyone should strive to set a five. You set a five at pace, you set a five at volume, you set a five at energy, then from that, you can play with up, you can play with down. And I think, I think you orchestrate that in certainly in social settings, like you're talking about how can you adjust that? I think we have to become hyper aware of our environment and, 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 and get back to reading social cues. You know, I think we've kind of morphed away from being able to read social cues. In fact, you know, are people stepping back from me? Oh, okay, maybe I need to pull back. Maybe I'm delivering at a seven and I really need to pull back to that five. But we've got to have that gauge. We've got to have that baseline. And what's interesting, if I work with someone who's really loud and they're, you know, they're all like this up, uh, you know, telling me this and telling me that. And I'll say, scale of one to 10, what are you doing? Oh, I'm doing a five. Uh, no, no, that's a 9.5, you know? And, and so, so we have to kind of recalibrate because what we feel, what we know, that's our top layer in our muscle memory. And to us, that feels normal. That feels normal. So we have to kind of recalibrate and go back to that five and then work in those higher and lower shades. And from a technique perspective, that's what adds in variety. Now that can be done organically for, and that's a lot of those speakers that you're talking about, they're just gregarious. A lot of that is organic. Um, maybe, maybe it's technique that's laid in that has become their own. But I think that, that we really have to reset at a five and work from there and then really go back and revisit social cues. What's the nonverbal feedback we're getting? You know, what, what are people doing? Are they walking away? Are they, are they checking their phones? Are they stepping back? Are they getting on us? You know, and adjusting on that scale of one to 10, that scale of one to 10 is one of the greatest things ever for situations like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we suggest to be cautious and kind of, you know, pay attention to how people react to you and, you know, adjust accordingly, uh, depending on, you know, what you see. Yeah, and I think also, I think we've kind of, we also need to revisit the art of listening. I see this a lot. I, I see this a lot. And I think this comes from the noise of the world we live in. Everybody's ready to, I got to tell you, I got to gotta tell you what, let me tell you, I got to talk, let me talk. <laughs> I don't even let you finish. I gotta tell you something. You know, we <laughs> so desperately need to be heard. But I gotta, oh, yeah. it's, it's okay. I can let you finish your sentence. I can let you ask me the question. I can think about the answer and then I can respond. You know, oh, yeah. and I think we have to start listening again. And I think that just comes from, we live in a very, you know, 2015 <laughs> is way noisier than 1983 was. Way noisier. Right. Oh, yeah. So we're all ready. I got to be ready. I got to get to get my word in. You know. Yeah, that actually reminded me. One of my listeners was uh, was listening to one of the interviews I had made for the podcast, and he said, "Oh my God, this person didn't let you speak." Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I was like, "Okay." <laughs> so yeah. it, it was so obvious that you know, even after uh, some editing, it was still could be wow. out by the listeners. Yeah. 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 I see it everywhere. I see it everywhere. And it, it's really a bit of a, 
it's a bit of a pet peeve of mine, you know, um, and I get it. I get it because people so desperately want to be heard. You know, for me, I grew up with interrupters and now at my age, I sometimes accidentally interrupt because I'm I forget what I'm going to say, you know, but that's different than just that constant. I'm not listening to you because I got to say my stuff. <laughs> you know, yeah. we have to start listening again. Okay, I see. Well, to, to wrap up the podcast, I'll just ask you the last question and then we can move to our uh, blob audience and answer their questions, I guess. Great. Okay, so just, you know, if you had just one advice to give to a person who is not confident enough in himself, in his voice, uh, physical voice, writing voice, behavior, and, you know, it's kind of so insecure that he, he's kind of afraid to share his writings, afraid to meet other people, kind of, you know, a closed up person who has a lot to say, but he, he's just, you know, not secure enough to do that. Where should he start? What should he do from the very beginning? First of all, let go of the idea that people are going to judge your voice, they're going to judge your words, they're going to judge what you look like, because the people that need to hear your message are going to love what you look like, love what you sound like, love what you say. Get past, and it took me years to get to this point, you're not going to speak to everyone. There, there are, there are going to be criticisms. There are going to people. Some people don't like me and my teaching style, and I'm okay with that now. Get connected to the message that you have to share, and the people that are going. It's going to resonate with, and let that be your courage and confidence, and. Trust me, trust me, trust me. Take a baby step and put that out there. Run to the roar. And I think you're absolutely going to be dumbfounded by the positive response that you get versus what you think is going to happen. Knowing that you are speaking your truth to the people who need it the most. And the rest of the people, they're gonna connect with somebody else and that's okay. That's why we're all here. You know, yeah. if, it, if it was just me and you, and we could cover the whole world. Okay, we got this. You, these are yours, these are mine. <laughs> but there's a million people and they need to connect with a million different people. So let that go. And, you know, let let it, if, you, if there is criticism, let it go. Because you know what? Most of the time it's not about you. Oh yeah. Run to the sure. roar, run to the roar, baby. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you for coming for the Right to Be Right podcast. I really appreciate your time. It was really nice talking to you. Oh, I loved being here. I just loved it. Thank you so much for having me. And this was so fun. Oh, yeah, it's, it's really great. I, I think it will be more fun now when we will start addressing our audience questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I have to put my glasses back on. I can't, I can't see. So, but I know okay, they, so, they, they have a, a glare yeah. on them. Okay, so we have the, the first question comes from Jackie. She says that with all the new FaceTime on Blob and Periscope, do you have any recommendations for warming up so that you, our voice is optimized before going live? Oh, fantastic question. I'm going to teach you. There's lots of things I could say, but I want to teach you a really cool trick. Going back to that core five. So our goal is to basically present at a five and then play shades of that. What happens is we think we're going to come in at a five, but we get nervous. And so we fall in at a three. Well, if I'm at a three, then I'm delivering more like this. And that's not really as engaging as my five, right? So get a piece of text, get a story, get a script, get something. And before you go live, absolutely go wild with it. Be loud, be quiet, be just go crazy. You'll come right in the door at a five because uh, it, it, it's that overdoing. It lays it in the muscle. I call it over practice is what I call it. It's laying it in then that you get in and you're nervous and there they are. And what am I going to say? But you fall in at a perfect five and you're still engaging. 
Um, that is that is one of the things that I get the most bang for the buck for with people. Um, but another really another really cool thing is to hum. You can hum or you can yawn. Yawning is really good because it stretches the muscle and drops your jaw, so that your words yeah your words will then come straight out of your mouth rather than fall through the bottom of your mouth. So you'll be more articulate. So those are two, uh, two two surefire hits that you can do to warm up before you go live. I think the first one should be recorded. It will yeah. be fun to watch. <laughs> oh, I know, right? And it's amazing. I've done it live with people, and they look at me like, okay, seriously? And I'm like, just trust me. And then, boom, when they deliver, spot on. Okay. And is this the same? Uh, because we have similar question, which says, what is a good way to warm up one's voice for an interview? Same thing. Um, one, and I'm going to give you another crazy one. Um, one of the biggest issues is articulation, and I hate that word in interviews, and really in anything. And I hate that word because you say articulation, and people think that they are supposed to start talking like this, and that's not what articulation is in in my world at all. Our sound tends to not come straight out. And that's, again, it's a vulnerability issue. We want to, we want to guard it. We want to leave it in. I don't want you to, I don't want you to judge me. We want that sound coming out because you want to sound articulate when you go on that interview. Now you're going to think this one's crazy. Make a duck face. Okay. Say some lines with your mouth forward like that. What that does is it stretches those muscles forward and it literally pulls that sound where it will then come wow. forward and out of your mouth by default. And so you don't have to over articulate, but yet you won't go in there and answer the questions like this because your voice is stuck in the back of your throat, you know? So say a few lines like this. And then when you go in and speak, the sound will come straight out. Wow, interesting. Who would have known? I mean, I know, right? <laughs> I know. But it works. It's like unbelievable. If people were live in the room, we did it. It's just mind bending to me. And that's the power of the muscle memory. That's just the power of technique. It's really cool stuff. How did you find out all that? <laughs> that is literally how I was trained when I was 17 years old. And then I studied with masters over the years and then working with many, many clients. I based on that education, I just started trying out stuff to see what would work. Okay, this is what you need. How can I make that happen? Try this. But I am so, uh, so trained in the muscle memory and believe in it so strongly that if we can shift those muscles, we can literally shift the way the words come out of our mouth. So it's a combination of education, of th you know, 30 years of education and then just live experience with people and figuring out what works and what gets the fastest results. Okay, I see. And does one get to a stage when it comes kind of you know, naturally already and you don't really have to think about it before speaking? Absolutely. I'm so glad you asked that question because I get it a lot. People will say, well, this feels weird and I, this isn't, I sound not natural. Good, good, because that means you're doing it right. So there's a practice period. You learn the technique, you lay it in. As you're laying it in, you only do it in practice. You don't go out and talk in the world like this. I don't want you out in the world like this, but I want you doing that in practice. And then literally one day you wake up and you're doing it. It might take a week, it might take a month, but I haven't thought about voice principles in application to myself in 30 years, but I spent two months laying it in.